Thank you, Mara Jean, for that warm welcome, and thank you to the Foundation for asking me to speak. Um, I'm going to give you a Crook's tour of diabetes and obesity, and um, I really want us to talk about how we might dodge the bullet, because if there's anything that's going to really threaten human health today, it's diabetes. If diabetes was a nation, we'd be, it would be the fifth most populous nation in the world just to give you an idea of the global scope of this disease. Um, this is how it looks at the moment for obesity. Obesity is the clearest driver of the bulk of diabetes that we see. And what I want to focus on is, is this here, 70 to 80% of men in their most productive years of life are currently overweight or obese. Now, if you think about that in terms of pure economic senses, how that affects our, the Australian productivity, the Australian workforce, corporate knowledge progressing through the years, by this stage we're going to see quite a few dropouts through illness that is preventable. Um, this is what's happened to the prevalence of obesity in this country over the last 15 to 20 years, and you can see the prevalence has actually doubled. And they're rather frightening statistics. Um, you know, clearly it's not a problem in this room, but I'd, I'd challenge you to head out west. Now, if we just look at obesity and how much disease it actually causes, about a quarter of all cases of diabetes can be directly attributable to obesity. A quarter of cases of heart disease and a quarter of cases of cancer. And this is what it feels like. Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, when I head to the clinical coalface, we're looking at this tidal wave of obesity that is coming at us across all age groups. It's not just the middle-aged, it's amongst children, um, it's amongst our elderly. And, you know, this is how we see ourselves. We think that we're still like this, but the reality is that, well, they probably won't make it to the wave, these fellows. <laughs> And so I want us to just reflect on how we can improve health. Um, I want us to just imagine what would happen if people lost five to 10 kilograms. Amongst, well, clearly nobody in this room has the problem, but amongst people that are overweight or obese, what can we expect will happen if people lost five or 10 kilograms in weight? We would save millions of dollars in diabetes medications, millions of dollars in cholesterol lowering medication and we'd keep people at work and productive. Imagine if we could prevent diabetes. That's not um, impossible. We know that the problem of diabetes starts with an antecedent, the predecessor to beta cell failure, which the beta cells are what make insulin in our pancreas, and they fail eventually, usually because of our genes, but also because of environmental accelerants, and obesity is a major um, accelerant. Preceding the beta cell burnout, before the beta cells turn up their toes, is an excess production of insulin, and that happens because of, of central obesity predominantly. You don't have to be globally obese, just carrying the centimetres around the waistline can do this. And we know that that promotes a whole lot of changes in the brain and our muscles. It starts promoting um, the growth of plaque in arteries. It um, produces inflammation that affects the entire body from our joints through to the liver, through to the brain. And we know that adipose tissue, my, my sort of key research interest, is that um, when you have healthy fat cells, you have all these quiet inflammatory cells here in between all the adipocytes. And if you like, these inflammatory cells are the conductors of the function of adipose tissue. They will decide whether adipose tissue is merely a benign bank of energy that we use when the famine comes or when we need that extra um, little sandwich we're on the bushwalk or playing the, th the fifth set of tennis. But when we're carrying too much fat, these inflammatory cells become more malevolent. They become pro-inflammatory. They make fat cells make all of these chemicals that are basically erosive to every organ you can think of, starting from the tip of our head, from our brain, down to the nerve cells at the end of our feet, where people get anything from dementia to neuropathy. In the liver, it causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is now the most commonest cause of cirrhosis. 
And of course, these chemicals are what are promoting those changes in the coronary arteries that produce atheroma. So I'm going to talk about a project that we've had going for a while called the Six Kilo Difference. It's a weight loss program that I've been running in people with diabetes and obesity. Uh, predominantly, I'm interested in what happens to the diabetes, turning the tables on diabetes, reversing diabetes. It's not a dream, it can actually happen. And I just show here um, a gastric band, and, and again, this is what can happen before and after. The internet is full of pictures like this, and, and it is a wonderfully empowering experience to lose that amount of weight. And so I showed you the band, which causes restriction to food intake by just putting a block here. You can have something called the sleeve gastrectomy, which puts a block on how much you can eat um, by limiting the amount you can fill in your stomach before you decide to stop. And then this is the Rouen Y bypass, which bypasses the bulk of the stomach and creates this conduit where you bypass here. By doing this, people actually eat a lot less because they get all sorts of side effects if they do eat an excessive food. And so what unifies these three procedures, any bariatric procedure, is caloric restriction. And for people who try and try and can't lose weight through the standard mechanism of just cutting down their calories, this will be the crutch that gets them there. And so this is what we saw. We started off with people that had um, diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. And you can see from the abnormal here, by the 24 weeks after they'd lost 17 kilos, most people, about 88%, um, had shifted their glucose tolerance from diabetes to either impaired glucose, um, so this is your um, impaired glucose tolerance or pre-diabetes, to absolutely normal. And what we saw was that that happened within the first two weeks with that very modest weight loss of six kilos only. So the bulk of people will shift across with just a six kilogram weight loss. And we looked at why that might be, because I, we thought that this was fascinating. We always thought you had to reverse the obesity before the diabetes would resolve. And we actually showed, no, you don't. You actually just need to have some calorie restriction. And that happens, the reversal of diabetes happens very, very easily. And to our, um, not surprise, because we thought it might have something to do with all that inflammation that we showed you, it actually came down to these cells here, which are the T cells, the T lymphocytes, that are a major determinant of which way our immune system goes. The T cells are what fight infection. They're what catalogue the viruses and the bacteria that we have been exposed to in the past and retain that memory of, in our immune system that knows how to attack. Now, one of the major factors that determines the activity of these T lymphocytes are how many calories we're eating. And so we were able to show a marked reduction in the pro-inflammatory cells that this cell produces, the granulocytes, the monocytes, remembering that the monocytes are the ones that cause the atheroma in, in blood vessels. And we saw these major changes in the T helper ones, which are, I suppose, the conductor that promotes inflammation, and an increase in the T helper twos, which are the calming T cells. These are the T cells that set our immune system back into balance. And so, of course, what we're doing is at the, um, what we're seeing is that we reduce these T cells here and it stops the process of atheroma. And we know from studies, long-term studies that have followed people that have had bariatric surgery, at 10 years they have half the heart attack rate of people who, haven't, who remain obese. We also know that 60% of cancers are stopped by bariatric surgery, again showing that you remove, that obesity presses on the accelerator pedal towards, uh, towards cancer, and by addressing obesity, you basically take the foot off the accelerator pedal and you can stop, you can prevent 60% of incident cancers. And these were major cancers, not skin cancer. Um, we also looked at um, arterial augmentation. This is the flexibility of arteries. And don't forget these people have stiff arteries, they've got diabetes. And we can use, we've got this instrument that we use in the clinical research unit um, called the SphygmaCore. It was actually designed by Michael O'Rourke, who's one of our most revered cardiologists here at St. Vincent's. And it looks at the flexibility of arteries. And we know that if you have stiff arteries, based on studies that Michael O'Rourke did, that you've got a much higher risk of dying. And so what we were able to show was that we could significantly reduce 
the arterial stiffness by 25% in these overweight people with diabetes through calorie restriction and modest weight reduction. Again, that's six kilo difference. But we know that quite a lot of obesity is in the genes. Unless you have the genes for obesity, you won't be obese. You might put on five kilos at Christmas um, and then you'll get it back off again. But to actually become obese, you have to have the marvelous survivor genes that have allowed us in the past to survive the repeated famines and the wars and the blockades. Um, anybody that survived the St. Petersburg blockade, I'm sorry, they've got obesity genes. You wouldn't have made it through um, otherwise. And there have been multiple other um, occasions. If we look at men who have served on the Burma Railroad and survived the concentration camps, I can tell you because I worked at Concord, most of them had diabetes later in life. So you have to have had those, uh, those wonderful genes that can hold on to the energy. The problem is we don't live in a society, thank goodness, anymore in an environment where there is extreme privation. Um, we uh, have a smorgasbord that follows us around. And for the people that have the genes and are exposed to an environment of chronic energy excess, they'll manifest their genetic potential. So what I love about this Anne Getty's picture is that, you know, we can see the wiring and we can see that the wiring starts very early. Um, a study that I did as part of my PhD at the Garvin was looking at how much in twin studies, how much of our genes attribute to the difference between one person and the next in the amount of body fat that we carried. And we were able to show that it was 50%. So 50% of the difference between one person and the next is directly attributable to their genetic makeup. The other 50% is their environmental choices or the environment that they, they find themselves in. But when it came to abdominal fat, that fat around the middle, which is so particularly harmful and such a high risk factor for diabetes, it was even more. It was 60%. But does it really matter what your genes say? What about the environment? Does it matter what you put in your mouth? Well, yes, of course. We were able to show, again, as part of my PhD, that you can actually turn down the diabetes genes. So if you have the genes for diabetes, but you maintain a higher level of physical activity by doing this sort of thing, and that would also be the, the electronic device, you are able to actually prevent being obese. And we know that that's the case now with other studies that have, um, have shown similar things. And we were also able to show that you could turn up your obesity genes by having a certain intake of an excess of carbohydrates. And we know now, sort of what's that, um, 15, 17 years on, that the sugar is probably in our diet is probably what's promoted most of the obesity and diabetes that we see. And so we have this phenomenon of environment being able to turn on or turn off the genes. But how does that happen? Well, epigenetics is one of the reasons that that happens. And epigenetics is basically um, changes in the, D it changes in the not changes in the DNA, the DNA stays the same, but it's changes in the marks along the DNA code that will basically turn on or turn off a gene. And so we know that the DNA ravels itself around histones and that when DNA is read, you travel along here. Now, based on the acetylation or methylation, basic chemical changes that are attracted to this compound here, it will either be read and encoded and manifest or not read and not encoded and not manifested. So I may have the, the obesity genes, but I won't show them if I have the right pattern of methylation along here. And it's environmental factors that do that at the moment. We mostly use environmental factors. But in the future, as we understand the coding along the DNA with the methylation and the acetylation pa patterns, we will be able to actually turn on or turn off these genes. And this is work that we've, we're doing at the moment in adipose tissue, working with Sue Clark, who is um, one of our, our chief, epi an internationally renowned epigeneticist here at the Garvin. And I want to follow on from um, um, some of the, the talks that Tony, the talk that Tony gave, because I, this is why you should always follow your mother's advice and wear your best clean underwear to the doctor. <laughs> but these are three women and what they share, aged um, 62, 33 and 52, is diabetes. Now, you wouldn't say any of these women are obese, would you? 
What they've all got is a condition called lipodystrophy, which is a genetic condition of the inability to put fat on where it's safe, which is on our bottoms and hips, and putting it, even in this very lean young lady, keeping it all here in the middle. And you can see it more in this lady here, who's got skinny, skinny pegs. You know, they're the kind of legs you put in a miniskirt. But look at her tummy here. That's where all her fat is. And she has a genetic condition called lipodystrophy. Now, with the genome sequencing, we'll be able to find out what the genes are for these ladies. And that will help us determine the exact treatment that we need to give them because at the moment we just blindly follow the guidelines that take us through a pathway of diabetes tests. It's through certain conditions related to diabetes and obesity that we have found, for example, leptin deficiency, a genetic disorder that causes obesity that can now be treated by just simply replacing the missing hormone leptin. And that cures obesity and diabetes in these overweight um, children and uh, young adults that get diabetes by age six, seven, eight. These are genetic conditions. By sequencing, we'll be able to find these. Now, um, our problem is that we, we had a grant, Tony and I had a grant in together and we didn't uh, get funded. Um, but we, we will pursue this because the people um, we see regularly with these conditions and, um, and, and you know, we are a hope for them. So if I take you back to my original slide, and I'd, I'd like us to imagine, let's use our imagination, let's exercise it and let's dream a little. And let's, let's imagine a world where um, there's little obesity and all of its me medical consequences of diabetes, cancer, heart disease. Imagine a world without diabetes so that we don't have diabetes as the first cause of kidney failure and dialysis dependence where we don't have diabetes as the primary cause of blindness. And that's true for both of those conditions in Australia. It's diabetes. Imagine if we can turn down those diabetes and obesity genes. Thank you very much.